back of session. Provision somehow does not apply because Gruden is no longer an employee. 
But there's no requirement that the commissioner issue a formal opinion. And any contrary argument would be for the arbitrator to decide in the first instance under the Supreme Court's decision in DG Group. Gruden's conduct here, the dissemination of these racist, sexist, and homophobic emails, including vile comments about the head of the NFL Players Association, was facially conduct that was detrimental to the best interests of the league. And while Gruden may no longer be an employee, his claims concern the termination of his employment agreement. And if it were not clear that they are covered, the Federal Arbitration Act instructs that any doubts about the scope of an arbitration provision must be resolved in favor of arbitration. Now, as I said at the outset, Gruden's primary argument before this court is not that the Constitution's arbitration provision does not apply by its terms, but rather that it is unenforceable and therefore unconscionable. But even under California law, Gruden must show that the provision is both procedurally and substantively unconscionable. And in our view, he cannot show either. Now, as to procedural unconscionability, Gruden really doesn't spend a lot of time on this in his response. But in our view, he can't really argue that he was subject to unequal bargaining power or coercive uh, bargaining tactics. After all, Gruden was of a sophisticated actor here. He had worked in various positions in the league over the course of decades. He had secured a record $100 million contract for the Raiders. And he was represented by perhaps the leading agent for NFL coaches. And while Gruden suggests that he was unable to negotiate the terms of the NFL Constitution, that would not be sufficient to render the agreement unenforceable, for instance, as a contract of adhesion. And not only did Gruden agree to be bound, but as I said earlier, he went so far as to acknowledge that he had read and understood the Constitution's terms. Now, as to substantive unconscionability, Gruden's primary argument is that the arbitration provision did not provide for a neutral arbitrator. But it has long been the practice of the NFL, like other major professional sports leagues, for the commissioner to arbitrate claims brought by current or former employees of the league's clubs. And courts around the country have upheld the commissioner's ability to arbitrate appeals from his own disciplinary determinations and disputes involving the league. We cite the NFL Management Commission uh, Council and the Peterson cases, among others, on the federal court of appeals law. And in our view, that is particularly appropriate here because there was no cognizable basis for naming Commissioner Goodell as a defendant in the first place. And in our view, Gruden included him into this action in an obvious attempt to create the appearance of conflict. But in any event, our principal submission to this court is that any argument that the commissioner would be an improper arbitrator here is premature and in any event provides no basis for voiding the entire arbitration provision. And that's for the simple reason that the commissioner has the power to designate a different arbitrator to hear disputes within his jurisdiction, as the commissioner has done on multiple occasions in the past. And we cite the Peterson and Williams cases as examples of that. And even if the commissioner did elect to hear this dispute himself, it is clear that the proper forum in which to challenge the partiality of the arbitrator is in the context of the arbitration itself, and if necessary, in a motion to vacate the ensuing arbitral award on grounds of evident partiality under the Federal Arbitration Act. It's not appropriate to do that before the arbitrator has even been designated. And even if it were otherwise, the proper remedy would be to sever the provision's designation of the arbitrator, not to allow the group to evade his contractual obligation to arbitrate altogether. Now, one final point on substantive unconscionability, Your Honor. Gruden also suggests that the arbitration provision is invalid because it is somehow not mutual or illusory. But the Raiders, no less than Gruden, signed the employment agreement and therefore agreed to be subject to the NFL Constitution's terms. And the Constitution itself, by its terms, binds the NFL's member clubs as well. The mere fact that an arbitration is triggered by the commissioner's opinion that the underlying conduct is detrimental does not create any sort of circularity for the simple reason that any ultimate determination by the arbitrator on the merits of Gruden's tort claims would not invalidate the opinion by the commissioner that triggered the arbitration. And any effort to suggest that state law imposes substantive limitations on arbitration provisions beyond the generally applicable doctrine of unconscionability would violate the Federal Arbitration Act. 
Now, finally, on this motion, Gruden's claims would also be covered by the arbitration provision in his employment agreement. Now, there's no need for the court to reach the terms of the arbitration provision in the employment agreement if the court uh, agrees that the, perhaps in some respects, broader provision in the NFL Constitution applies. But again, I, I would just make two very quick points with regard to the provision in the employment agreement. The first is that Gruden does not seriously argue that his claims fall outside the substantive scope of the arbitration provision. That provision covers, quote, without limitation, any dispute arising from the terms of this agreement, end quote. And it is long settled, in fact, the Hansen case, among others, that four claims, including claims for intentional interference with contract, are within the scope of similarly worded and broadly worded arbitration provisions. Instead, here, Bruton's primary argument is that the arbitration provision in his employment agreement applies by its terms only to matters in dispute between Gruden and the Raiders. But we submit that on the unusual facts of this case, the defendants are entitled to invoke the arbitration provision under the doctrine of equitable estoppel, which is, of course, one of the doctrines under which non-signatories are entitled to invoke arbitration provisions. Now, in this case, the NFL defendants aren't really even true non-signatories because the commissioner himself signed the agreement, and so I think that the defendants can be not, not as a party. Not as a party, that's correct. In his capacity as a commissioner, and we would simply concede that the agreement is an agreement by its terms between Gruden and the Raiders. But I think for purposes of the doctrine of equitable estoppel, our submission is that Gruden's claims rely on and really presume the existence of the contract. And I think that there would be no real dispute that if Gruden had proceeded with his claims against the Raiders, rather than settling those claims first, uh, and done so together with the claims against the NFL defendants, that all of the claims would have been sent to arbitration. And our submission is that the mere fact that Gruden settled his claims against the Raiders should not alter the outcome. But again, I would just underscore that with regard to the NFL Constitution, there's no such limitation with regard to the parties. The dispute here is really about whether uh, other doctrines would limit the application of that arbitration provision or that Gruden should somehow not be bound by it. And so this issue would only apply in the event that the court disagreed with our arguments on that score. Unless the court has any questions, I'll yield to my colleague on the other side and we're happy to address any other points on the bottom. Thank you. Great, thank you. Your Honor, again, Adam Hoffman-Henner and John Brown on behalf of the plaintiff, John Gruden. The fact that John Gruden settled his claims to the Raiders very much doesn't have this case. Because the question I want to pose first is whether John Gruden could have filed a demand for arbitration in November 2021 on the same day that he filed his complaint. The answer is no. That employment agreement was terminated. The dispute resolution clause in that uh, employment agreement was terminated and then was replaced with a separate settlement agreement. And that settlement agreement, which is highly confidential, all I'll say about it now is that it definitely doesn't include an arbitration provision where the commissioner of the NFL gets to decide a dispute between the Raiders and uh, John Gruden. So on, in November 2021, John Gruden had a settlement agreement with the Raiders providing for a different dispute resolution agreement. He could not have filed a demand for arbitration as they suggest he could have. Not only that, in November 2021, the commissioner of the NFL had not made a determination that any of the conduct, whether it's John Gruden's emails, or whether it's their intentional leaking of, the, of these emails to the press, or whether it's Commissioner Bidell himself, as an individual, calling the Raiders to demand that John Gruden be fired. No determination had been made that any of that conduct was conduct detrimental to the league. So how could John Gruden have filed a demand for arbitration? That early in the process, when the only people that can decide whether this dispute is arbitrable, according to defendants, is defendants themselves. There is no basis for John Gruden to seek to compel arbitration or demand arbitration in November 2021, and there's no basis to do so today. No court has ever compelled arbitration in a case like this, and this court should not be the first to do so. Defendants are asking this court to decide, without an opinion from Commissioner Cadell, that it would be his opinion that this represents conduct at the level of the league. And to refer the case to Commissioner Goodell so that he can decide for himself whether his conduct was wrongful. They didn't provide John Gruden any notice or hearing. They didn't follow any of their own internal procedures or policies. But today they're still asking for John to follow those same policies and procedures by sending this case to arbitration in front of Commissioner. 
Dr. Bell. The record simply isn't before this court. Neither John nor the Raiders could have submitted this dispute to arbitration under the provisions that the NFL is now trying to enforce. Those have been terminated and have been replaced by a separate dispute resolution clause. The NFL claims that it's a signatory but not a party to the employment agreement. But they can't keep that employment agreement in place or prevent the parties from replacing it with a separate settlement agreement, which is why they cannot invoke and stand in the shoes of either of the parties and try to compel this case to arbitration when neither John Gruden nor the Raiders could send this dispute to arbitration under the clause of the NFL today. Defendants and John Gruden do not enter any arbitration contract together. That alone separates this case from nearly every other arbitration case where the parties themselves are trying to enforce an arbitration agreement between themselves. Instead, defendants try to construct a valid agreement to arbitrate out of multiple links in a chain and flimsy connections. First, they rely on that terminated employment agreement. And I believe at least twice a lie of the key portion of that employment agreement that is not broad, that includes any dispute arising from the contract, but specifically by its plain language, only covers all matters in dispute between Gruden and Club. They cannot rewrite that agreement to state that the agreement covers all matters arising out of the agreement or related to the agreement. That limitation is critical, and courts have never allowed a non-signatory to expand the plain language of an arbitration clause beyond what it says in terms of its limitation of scope. So we do seriously challenge whether this dispute falls within the scope of that arbitration clause, even to the extent that that arbitration clause is in effect between the Raiders and Gruden, which it isn't. That arbitration clause says it only covers all matters in dispute between Gruden and Club. So again, they try to rewrite this to claim that this is a wrongful termination claim or something that arises out of the contract. Not so. Not one of the claims advanced by Plaintiff John Gruden depends on the language of the employment agreement that was terminated. Not one case that they've cited would extend the arbitration clause to cover claims brought into such context, where they didn't depend on the interpretation of the contract, on the breach of the contract, or anything related to the contract, except insofar as the potential element of damages. Absent a clear agreement to submit these disputes to arbitration, the court cannot compel arbitration. So what really matters, again, is what the parties actually agreed to. After John Gruden was forced to resign from the Raiders, he entered into that second settlement agreement. And that settlement agreement does not cover this dispute. So once that, there are circumstances where a settlement agreement or a determination of an arbitration clause could survive. There's no survival clause in the employment agreement. There is no intent by the Raiders or Gruden to continue that dispute resolution clause in the employment agreement indefinitely. In fact, the opposite is true because they specifically replaced that with a separate dispute resolution clause, which is outside of all the NFL internal procedures. At an absolute minimum, absolute minimum, this case needs to at least proceed to a procedural stage where that settlement agreement can be introduced into evidence under a stipulated protective order, where the Raiders are notified and given the opportunity to protect, since their interests are implicated by that settlement agreement as well. To the extent the court finds, though, although there's no precedent that we can identify, that the NFL and Roger Goodell are allowed to rely upon an arbitration clause in an agreement that's already been terminated by the parties, to the extent that's possible, even that agreement doesn't cover this dispute. We pointed out that it only covers all matters in dispute between the group and the club. It doesn't say the opposite of that construction, which is it covers all claims arising out of the settlement, arising out of the employment agreement, including without limitation disputes between the group and the club. It's the opposite structure, where it only covers disputes between the group and the Raiders, including but not limited to claims arising out of the arbitration clause. And they attempt to invoke the principle of equitable estoppel in order to allow themselves to intervene and be a party to that contract. That principle only applies where the party is essentially attempting to stand in the shoes of one of the signatory parties. Neither of the parties could invoke this contract, so there's no inherent unfairness about not permitting the NFL to take advantage of this employment agreement and this arbitration clause when the parties themselves couldn't invoke the arbitration clause, again, because it's been terminated. Even more, that principle only extends to situations where the cause of action is actually asserted against both the signatory and the non-signatory. So 
John Gruden's claims were actually against the Raiders and the NFL. That principle could apply to prevent someone from artfully pleading claims against both of them and then settling with one defendant. But the causes of action against the NFL are not from the contract. We're not talking about disputes between Gruden and the club that could be extended to what the NFL did. The NFL did wasn't just release emails, wasn't just tortiously interfere with this contract, but it was tortiously interfere with all prospective contracts of Mr. Gruden, including the sponsorship contracts. The bulk of the NFL's arguments are about the NFL Constitution. The wording of that Constitution, again, by its plain language, doesn't cover a former member of the NFL. It could, they could have inserted that language, but they didn't, and this makes sense, because the NFL commissioner is not intended to resolve all disputes until the end of time for anyone who used to be a member of the football team, a coach, or player. And if their reading is actually accepted, what that would mean is that the NFL commissioner, decades from now, could still compel any civil suit to arbitration as long as at some point in time that player or coach signed an employment agreement that incorporated the NFL Constitution. Their reading is so broad that it would cover any of these disputes that are making their rounds in the press, where a civil suit is brought by an employee of the Washington football team, by an employee of the Dallas Cowboys, against the NFL, against the member clubs, and on the commissioner's sole discretion, unilateral determination, that that involves conduct detrimental to the league, could take away that plaintiff's right to a jury trial and move that into arbitration in front of the commission itself. The defendants describe our argument that could elements actually issue a formal opinion as a prerequisite that must be, as a non-essential prerequisite that must be addressed by Commissioner Goodall himself. But that language of Section 8.3e itself only applies when the dispute itself constitutes conduct detrimental. As much as defendants try to argue that this case is about Mr. Gruden's emails, it's not. The validity of those emails, the, the content of those emails, is not going to be an issue in this case. What is going to be an issue is defendants' tortious conduct, leaking those emails to the press selectively, and then demanding that Mr. Gruden be fired by the Raiders, and threatening to release emails that we haven't even seen that may not even exist. It's that course of conduct that forms the basis for our complaint. So the NFL would have to make a determination that its own conduct, Commissioner Goodell and the NFL executives who pressured the Raiders to fire Gruden, constituted conduct detrimental to the league. There's a reason that Commissioner Goodell hasn't submitted a declaration in this case stating his opinion that this constitutes conduct detrimental to the league. Because in order to refer this dispute to arbitration, not the affirmative defenses that men may have, but this dispute, they would have to decide that he himself committed conduct detrimental to the league in order to refer this case to arbitration. But how does this court even fashion that order? We've thought a lot about how this court could issue an order of compelling arbitration based on what defendants have introduced in the record. It could be this court's opinion that Mr. Gruden's conduct, or for that matter, Commissioner Goodell's conduct, constituted conduct detrimental to the league. But defendants argue that that opinion is irrelevant, that your opinions are irrelevant. The only opinion that matters is Commissioner Goodell's. How does this court draft an order saying that arbitration should be compelled because in the opinion of Commissioner Goodell, who hasn't introduced a declaration, who hasn't provided testimony, who hasn't issued a formal opinion, like every other case they cite where there actually is a formal disciplinary process with a notice in here. How does this court fashion an order that it is Commissioner Goodell's opinion, without any admissible evidence, that this dispute involves conduct detrimental to the league? We couldn't do that in November 2021 because that determination hadn't existed. We couldn't have filed a demand for arbitration on that basis. And neither can this court issue a determination on that basis because that evidence is not before this court. This court cannot possibly substitute its opinion for Commissioner Goodell's, not according to our arguments, but according to defendants. On to unconscionability. We believe we're correct when we say no court has ever ordered arbitration in these circumstances. And this is why. For all the discussion about how John Gruden is a sophisticated coach and how he has a sophisticated agent, procedural unconscionability only requires a very small degree of procedural unconscionability 
when there's a sliding scale of substantive unconscionability. The NFL Constitution is an adhesion contract. It is not something that could be negotiated. And that's enough to move to the analysis of substantive unconscionability. And substantive unconscionability here is present in three very key areas. The first is the neutral arbitrator. The defendant's position is that Commissioner Goodell could decide not to hear this case, and that he has the ability, despite the plain language of the NFL Constitution, that invests his sole, absolute, unfettered discretion to resolve these cases with Commissioner Goodell. And they point to precedent where he is delegated to a, to a supposedly neutral arbitrator. But nothing in the plain language of this Constitution or the employment agreement requires him to do so. So this court is faced with the determination of sending this case to the very person the plaintiff is intending to sue. That's unconscionable because, and it doesn't just require the replacement of the arbitrator, it invalidates this process itself and invalidates the arbitration clause. The second is, is mutuality. Even for any employment agreement, any arbitration clause to survive, it has to contain a modicum of bilaterality. Here, defendants are simply incorrect when they say that both the Raiders and John Gruden agreed to send disputes via the NFL Constitution to the arbitrator. This is exactly what the Sneeze Act versus Kansas City Chiefs Football Club case held. Because even though the Raiders may in the abstract be bound by the NFL Constitution, they did not contractually agree to send any disputes of John Gruden to the commissioner of the NFL. All they contractually agreed to do, oh, and Gruden, to be clear, Gruden was the only party in that dispute resolution provision that agreed to comply with the NFL Constitution and abide by its terms. Defendants have argued that the Raiders had an obligation to comply with the NFL Constitution as well. It may be true, but they don't have a contractual obligation, as the Sneeze Act court found, to respond to Gruden in the exact same fashion. That makes that clause non-mutual. Because only Gruden would be required under the contract to comply with the dispute resolution provisions in the NFL Constitution. That's why the court did not order arbitration in the Sneeze Act, and that's why this court should not either. The third argument is about the circularity and status of this arbitration clause is completely illusory. Section 8.3 of the NFL Constitution identifies disputes as arbitral, not if they involve conduct detrimental. But if, in the opinion of the commissioner, they involve conduct detrimental, there is no way for John Gruden to have known the commissioner's opinion in November 2021. But that opinion can also change. It's circular because, in order for this dispute to be arbitral, the commissioner must be of the opinion that the conduct involved conduct detrimental relief. That's like saying a dispute is arbitral only if plaintiff has breached the contract. That's not the scope of the arbitration. That's the result of the arbitration. So only if Mr. Gruden did something wrong is this dispute arbitral. And if it turns out his conduct was not detrimental relief and the commissioner's opinion was wrong, then that means the arbitration should, the case should never have been sent to arbitration in the first place. But no court, again, has ever compiled arbitration where one party gets to solely and unilaterally determine the scope of the arbitration clause. And that's what the commissioner can do here. In his opinion, and again, this is not bound by any principles in the NFL Constitution, defendants vaguely try to argue that it's bounded by the principle of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. But again, Gruden and the NFL are not parties to any contract. So that implied covenant cannot be applied against the NFL in favor of Gruden. But the arbitration clause is illusory. If one party can unilaterally revoke it, unilaterally amend, unilaterally determine its scope. What predictability is there? What advance notice did Mr. Gruden have that his claims could be arbitral when it depends on the NFL and the commissioner's sole discretion in terms of the scope of that arbitration clause? Conduct detrimental is defined. It's not bounded by any safeguards. It apparently can't be challenged according to defendants. And this court doesn't know whether it's conduct detrimental because Commissioner Goodell has made that determination. But we would actually ask this, even though the court doesn't need to reach the employment agreement, doesn't need to reach the NFL Constitution, because these aren't contracts that can be enforced by Mr. Gruden by the Raiders, and so certainly can't be enforced by the NFL. 
even though the court doesn't need to reach that question. We would ask that this court go further and hold as a matter of principle that an arbitration contract, just like any other contract in Nevada, is looser if one party has a unilateral right to determine, to determine its scope, determine its terms, and decide whether they are going to comply with that agreement by determining something that's conflict detrimental, or not, uh, not a degree and comply with that agreement by determining the contract is not detrimental. To conclude, Your Honor, the plain language of this agreement, of any agreement, does not cover Mr. Gruden's claims against defendants, and there's no agreement to arbitrate. But we also do need to look at the practical reality here. It's not a circumstance where the dispute about, where this is a procedural dispute, what about the same merits and the same discovery will take place in front of you or in front of Judge Tagliati at ARN. This is about whether John Gruden can present his claims at all, about whether he can present them in a neutral form in front of someone who he's not directly suing, about whether he has the right to obtain any discovery because the NFL and Commissioner Goodell can shut that down at their sole discretion. And the precedent created by such a decision, which would be new precedent, would be so remarkable and so harrowing that going forward, the Commissioner of the NFL could refer any dispute by any employee, by any cheerleader, by any worker in the Washington football team, to arbitration based on their unilateral opinion that it constitutes conduct detrimental relief. Not only that, that opinion doesn't need to be provided in a formal hearing, doesn't need to be provided with notice, with the right to discovery, doesn't need any safeguards at all. The second there is an employment claim brought by any member of any of these parties, the commissioner of the league can take their right to share a trial away and move that into private arbitration with no discovery in front of the commissioner itself. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll be relatively brief since I know we have another motion before you today. Let me turn first to the NFL Constitution. My friend, Mr. Cosmer Henner, doesn't really renew any argument today that that provision was somehow not incorporated in the employment agreement. Instead, other than unconscionability, he makes just two arguments that I want to address very briefly. The first is this argument that the commissioner somehow needs to issue a formal opinion that there is conduct detrimental to the best interests of the league. Again, our submission is that by the plain terms of the NFL Constitution, that's not required. To step back here, I think it's somewhat extraordinary for my friend to suggest that the commissioner would not reach that conclusion. I think we can have a fair degree of confidence that the commissioner indeed has reached that conclusion. After all, we filed the motion to compel arbitration on behalf of the commissioner here. But I think when you look at the underlying conduct here, and I am not going to get into the content of these emails. They are not fit to be repeated in a public courtroom. I think there's no reasonable person who can conclude that that is not conduct detrimental to the league to have. That is correct, which is to say that the emails were sent before he signed the contract. But the terms of the contract between Gruden and the Raiders make clear that that is conduct for which he can be discharged for cause. And so I think the fact that that conduct took place before he was employed and continued to have effect while he was employed does not preclude the application of either of the arbitration provisions at issue here. And what I would add to that is that to the extent that the second point that my friend makes is this point about the chronology here, the fact that this conduct had a nexus to his role as the coach of the Raiders is sufficient for limiting any concern that this provision could be invoked in perpetuity as the conduct that has nothing to do with the employee's role as an employee of the league. If someone from the NFL 20 years from now got into a car accident with Coach Gruden, that might be a different situation. But here, this is conduct for which Coach Gruden could have been terminated by the Raiders. He, of course, chose to resign instead. And therefore, it falls within the ambit of the arbitration provision. And after all, the claims that we're going to be talking about on the motion to dismiss here are all claims that involve interference with the contractual relationship in some way, shape, or form. 
So that takes me to the uh, unconscionability arguments. I'll just make a couple of additional points because I think most of our arguments have already been there. So first of all, with regard to procedural uh, unconscionability, it is certainly true that under California law, it is a sliding scale. But here in our view, there is no procedural unconscionability. And I think that the law with regard to contracts of adhesion is quite clear. We cite the Rockwood case for the proposition that a contract is only a contract of adhesion if it involves you know, a standard form that is drafted and imposed by a party with superior bargaining. This is not that situation. And I, I think that in order to have a contract of adhesion at a minimum, Mr. Gruden would have to have alleged that the only options that he had were either to reject the contract or to agree to the terms of the Constitution. He has not done so. I want to focus primarily on substantive unconscionability because that's where my friend Mr. Osmer Henry spent most of his time. And I want to address the two primary arguments that he made with regard to substantive unconscionability. First, with regard to bilateral morality. He cites the Smezak versus Kansas City Chiefs case, but I think that the fundamental difference in that case was that the Constitution was not incorporated into the agreement at issue. And so the court, the Missouri court in that case, expressed concern that the team in that case really wasn't bound by the arbitration provision because the Constitution could potentially be amended and because it did not agree to any obligation to find an energy independent contract. I think this is a different situation. With regard to this issue of circularity, first of all, I think it's crucial to keep in mind that the claims that are going to be resolved in arbitration are not claims that require a determination that there is conduct detrimental to the league. These are standard state law claims, the elements of which uh, obviously vary from claim to claim. But the determination that's going to be made is a much different determination about the merits of Mr. Green's substantive claims. I don't think that there's anything substantively unconscionable about the fact that the commissioner has to make a determination in order to remit the claim to arbitration. After all, as is true for a number of the other provisions in the NFL Constitution, in the arbitration section, section 8.3, if the provision didn't have that restriction, I don't think that there would be any argument that there's something unconscionable about a blanket provision that requires all disputes to be remitted to arbitration. The fact that one party to this case has the ability to make a determination that remits the claim to arbitration doesn't render the analysis any different. The final thing I would say is just a couple of points with regard to the employment agreement. First, Mr. Hosmer Henry started his argument by focusing on the terms of the settlement agreement between Mr. Green and the Raiders. He suggests that that agreement somehow terminated the arbitration provision in the original employment agreement. That argument is nowhere to be found in the opposition to the motion to compel. Um, uh, and so we're really hearing that argument for the first time today. My understanding is that there is nothing in that settlement agreement that somehow abrogates the existing arbitration provisions. At most, there is an arbitration provision in the settlement agreement itself, which I think would properly be understood to apply if there are any disputes arising out of the settlement agreement by its terms. But ultimately, uh, our fundamental submission with regard to the arbitration provision in the employment agreement is yes, it does contain a limitation with regard to the parties, unlike the provision in the NFL Constitution. That's where the doctrine of equitable estoppel comes into play. And our fundamental submission is that under these circumstances where you have claims that clearly by their terms arise from the contractual relationship between Mr. Breeden and the Raiders, and because the doctrine of equitable estoppel ultimately relies on the concept of fairness, it would be quite inequitable for the NFL defendants not to be able to invoke that provision where the claims rely on the contract solely by virtue of the fact that Mr. Green has reached a settlement with the Raiders here. And so for that reason, the fact that the provision contains that limitation is only the start of the analysis. It's not the end of the analysis because the whole point of the doctrine of equitable estoppel is that it creates an exception to the rule that parties' uh, limitations uh, in their arbitration provisions as to who is going to be able to invoke arbitration will ordinarily be respected. Unless the court has any further questions, we rest on our opinion.
does not affect the defendant's ability to invoke truth as a defense. Because the emails that Gruden uh, uh, sent that led to his resignation were fully his own, as were the sentiments, the vile and offensive sentiments expressed in them, any claim based on the provisions of those emails is subject to the absolute defense of truth. Now, second, and relatedly, Gruden has failed to plead that defendants lack privilege or justification for interfering with his existing contract or constructive economic advantage. While the Nevada courts have so far held only that the absence of privilege is an element to a claim for tortious interference with prospective advantage, Gruden offers no reason why a Nevada court should not extend that requirement to a claim of intentional interference with an existing contract. In both instances, there are certain justifications that have sufficient social value to justify interference with existing or prospective contractual relations. Here, the NFL had an obvious and unequivocal interest in rooting racism, sexism, and homophobia out of professional football. Indeed, both the NFL and the Raiders had the ultimate power to terminate Gruden for his conduct, which reflects the NFL's interest, memorialized in the Constitution, in taking action against anyone who engages in conduct detrimental to the league. And defendants had an especially strong interest here because the primary contract at issue was not with some unaffiliated third party, but rather with one of the league's member clubs. Now third, Gruden fails sufficiently to allege one of the elements of the claim, the specific intent required for a claim of intentional interference. And under settled Nevada law, we cite the JJ Industries case for this proposition, Gruden must plead the defendant intended to induce the Raiders to breach their contract with him or to prevent him from obtaining future economic opportunities. On this issue, Gruden offers only conclusory and inconsistent allegations of intent. It is wholly unreasonable to infer that Commissioner Goodell specifically intended to interfere with Gruden's contracts simply because Gruden used derogatory terms to refer to him. Nor is it reasonable to infer that defendants collectively had the requisite intent based simply on the fact that there were negative stories in the press concerning the NFL's investigation into the Washington football team. Even under Nevada's notice pleading standard, Gruden has failed to allege any actual facts supporting an inference that defendants acted with the requisite intent. Now, Gruden's negligence-based claims, and those are claims for negligence, negligent hiring, and negligent supervision are also invalid. Most fundamentally, Gruden has failed to allege that defendants owe him a duty to protect him from the public disclosure of the vile emails that he sent to NFL accounts. Notably, the NFL did not affirmatively collect those emails from Gruden's own account. Instead, he voluntarily sent those emails to various other individuals' accounts with no reasonable expectation those emails would remain confidential. And the mere fact that defendants chose not to release other emails they collected in connection with the WF2 investigation does not entail the conclusion that defendants owed an affirmative duty to Gruden, who had no connection to that investigation. But in any event, even if such a duty existed, it was obviated because, as a matter of law, Gruden assumed the risk that his non-private emails would be disclosed. And the Turner case, among others, teaches us that this is indeed a question of law and not a question of fact. Now here, there's no dispute about the relevant facts, because Gruden does not allege that he had any sort of understanding with the recipients of the emails that they would be kept confidential. As with letters, there's no expectation of privacy with emails upon delivery. And most Gruden alleges that he willingly sent emails to a third party recipient at the WFT address, that the WFT in turn sent those emails to the NFL, and that the NFL thereafter disclosed them. That cannot sustain a claim of negligence, because again, Gruden is in the list. In addition, with regard specifically to the claims for negligent hiring and negligent supervision, those claims fail because Gruden has not alleged that defendants knew that any employee had a dangerous propensity or was otherwise unfit for the employment position. That's the crux of any negligent hiring or supervision claim, and Gruden does not seriously suggest otherwise. And of course, Gruden's complaint contains no specifics concerning who the negligently hired or supervised employees were or what their role was in the and finally, Gruden's remaining claims as claims for aiding and abetting and for civil conspiracy 
are entirely derivative of his substantive tort claims, his intentional tort and negligence claims. And if those primary liability claims are dismissed, the secondary liability claims should be dismissed as well, because Breeden has to allege either an unlawful objective in the case of conspiracy or a wrongful act in the case of aiding and abetting in order for those secondary liability claims to proceed. In addition, with regard to the claim for conspiracy, employers and employees cannot conspire together when they're acting on behalf of the company. And to the extent that Breeden makes an allegation that Commissioner Goodell is somehow not acting on behalf of the NFL, that's at odds with his other allegations. And while, of course, Yes, together with allegations that he was acting on behalf of the NFL, and while, of course, alternative pleading is permitted in Nevada, these allegations are so inconsistent that it really renders it impossible for the defendants to know precisely what it is that Breeden is alleging here. In any event, the only way that Breeden can avoid the doctrine that employees within a single company cannot conspire is really by resting on that allegation. So our fundamental submission is that for the reasons stated in the papers that I've stated today, that the claims are legally defective, and we would submit that if the court agrees with us, the motion to dismiss should be granted with prejudice. And that's for the simple reason that there are no amendments that can address the fundamental legal deficiencies with Breeden's claims here. And, of course, Breeden cannot add allegations that would contradict the allegations in the existing complaint. And that's why we think that dismissal with prejudice would be the appropriate remedy. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, the motion filed by defendants doesn't challenge the plea that we filed. It challenges the plea that they wish we had filed. This case is not about Mr. Breeden's emails. It's not about a wrongful termination case. If you ask us if we want to go to the Southern afterwards, and one of the options is that Breeden becomes the head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders again, maybe we'll consider that. But this is not that case. This case is about defendants' tortious conduct. Sometime around 2021, June of 2021, the NFL executives obtained Breeden's emails as part of an investigation into the misconduct of the Washington football team in June of 2021. Those emails represented a small fraction of the 650,000 emails gathered in that investigation and predated Breeden's hiring by the Raiders and occurred at a time when he was no longer at the Raiders, dating all the way back to 2011. Those emails were deemed so confidential by the NFL that they refused to release them in response to a congressional request. And between June 2021 and October 2021, defendants took no action whatsoever with respect to those emails. On October 7, 2021, John Breeden was the head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders in first place in the division. And then on October 8, 2021, defendants leaked a selection of these emails to the press and to the Wall Street Journal. Those emails have never been made public. We haven't introduced them into the record. We've seen them only as a reflection of what the journalists reported. In the next few days, our complaint alleges that NFL executives and Roger Goodell himself, collectively calling them defendants, in paragraph 52 and 55 of our complaint, communicated with the Raiders and demanded that they fire him. They pressured the Raiders to fire him. And when the Raiders didn't let him coach through that weekend, defendants continued to threaten that more documents would be leaked until Mr. Breeden was fired. There is a stunning admission in the motion practice submitted by defendants that in between October 8 and October 11, 2021, they concede that they directly provided Breeden's emails and summaries of these emails to the Raiders. Despite their overall position, which is that we didn't do this, but we could have if we wanted to, but we definitely didn't do it, but we'd be privileged to leave these emails if we wanted to, they've admitted in their motion practice that they had the emails conveniently prepared between October 8 and October 11, 2021, and provided those and summaries of Breeden's emails directly to the Raiders, John Breeden's employer, as part of their communications demanding that the Raiders fire John Breeden. That's quintessential tortious interference. And the truth of those documents can't possibly be established with the state's proceedings. When the Raiders still did not fire Breeden on October 11, 2021, the defendants leaked more documents to the New York Times and continued that pressure until he ultimately was forced to resign on that same day. 
October 11, 2021, when some of his endorsement deals and sponsorships were canceled as well. They want to make this case about the conference of emails, but it's simply not. And they want to make this case just about the release of non-public e non emails that they say Mr. Green has no expectation of privacy about. But it's not just about the emails themselves. It's not even about the ones that were released. It's about their threats to the Raiders to continue releasing more emails, whether they're from this archive of 650,000 emails or not, until they got their way, until they intimidated, threatened the Raiders in, uh, in order to force them to fire uh, and terminate the piece of group. The court is well aware of the standard of dismissal in Nevada. I won't belabor any issues about their comments about the reasonableness of allegations or conclusory allegations. They simply get Nevada law wrong at those points. But each of our claims not only survives a motion to dismiss, but the arguments that they're raising now are really ones that should be raised, not even at summary judgment, but at trials. They involve disputed facts. The, the first defense they raise is that truth is an absolute defense. And they, uh, they fail to recognize that that is not the overwhelming authority in all jurisdictions. Certainly in some jurisdictions, truth is an absolute defense. But that's usually in the context of when honest advice is requested. And there's nothing more than the truthful publication of facts related to a claim for tortious interference. In the first place, that's not just what our claim is. Our claim isn't just about the disclosure of truthful information. It's about the pressure put by the defendants onto the Raiders. So truth has no bearing on those threats and those pieces of intimidation. The second argument is that this is really an affirmative defense that defendants must plead and prove. And to do so at this stage would at least require them to introduce the emails and prove that they're true. The emails aren't in the record. We don't have base stamps to point to. We certainly don't have the emails that they sent to the Raiders. We don't have the summaries they sent to the Raiders and have no way of admitting or verifying they're true. Our complaint definitely doesn't admit that these documents are true or represent proven specific emails. All it does is reflect the public reports by journalists that are summaries of the underlying emails. So we cannot affirmatively admit, and neither can defendants, that any of these documents are truthful. That, again, this goes back to how this court can craft an order saying that our claims should be dismissed at this stage because the underlying communications were truthful when the underlying communications haven't been provided to us or to this court. The next argument is that the partial disclosure of these emails is misleading in and of itself. This was an archive of information that was collected by defendants. To produce some of the emails and single John Gruden out, and not even all of the communications that we believe they have, is a misleading representation of the public and a misleading representation of the waivers. This isn't just a situation where a portion of an email is produced. But we have no idea of knowing whether they produce the entire email thread, the entire chain, to show the contents of these communications. They could have selectively curated them. We don't know because we haven't seen them. But when you produce a small section of that archive of emails, you make John Gruden look to be the only person who's communicating in this fashion in the entire NFL. The effect of dropping that entire archive, 650,000 emails, to the press all at once, it would be dramatically different than releasing six, seven of Mr. Gruden's emails by themselves and indicating that he stands apart from the rest of that archive. More importantly, on the issue of first impression of whether truth is an absolute defense here, that position has never been recognized in the past. This court absolutely can decide issues of first impression. But to do so now, at this stage of the pleading, when the documents aren't before you, to announce a rule on documents that aren't there, we believe would not be in the interest of the judicial economy. The second defense that defense raises is about privilege. Now, that defense would only apply in the context, uh, context of intentional interference with prospective economic advantage. And they say there's no logical reason why this court should not extend it to an intentional interference with an existing contract. But one of the reasons is that that Supreme Court has not. And they're asking this court to essentially overrule the elements for the intentional interference with contract that the Supreme Court has laid out. So they have five elements without privilege with respect to intentional interference with existing contracts. Five elements for prospective contracts that includes privilege as an element. It's not just extending the general principle to something the court has ruled on. The Nevada Supreme Court has ample opportunity 
to determine that privilege is one of the elements of international interference uh, system contracts, and it's never done so. In fact, it's laid out the opposite by separating those two causes of action. But even if privilege were to apply here to show that the NFL had a, had a privilege to disclose these emails to threaten the Raiders, our argument with respect to prospective economic advantage is this. It matters that the NFL had policies and procedures for addressing this conduct that they chose not to employ. To claim that you have a privilege to act in a way that is contrary to the NFL Constitution, to contrary to the notice and hearing and due process procedures set forth in the NFL Constitution, would mean that those procedures are meaningless within the NFL's own policies and procedures. If they could tortiously interfere with prospective economic advantage, because they're privileged to do so, outside of their contractual documents that would vitiate those contractual documents and allow them to do whatever they want without any notice of hearing for any of the employees of any of the leagues. They'd be able to circumvent those provisions. And they argue that with respect to either of these courts, I believe, we haven't pleaded specific intent. One, I believe this court, it's been a while, but in business benefits for Clark County School District, Specific, this court specifically held that intent only needs to be pleaded generally. That's specifically what the Nevada Rules of Civil Procedure say. And more importantly, we have it throughout our complaint that defendants did act intentionally, were aware of the contracts, and intended to disrupt it. No clearer example than paragraphs 52 and 55, where they actually demanded that the contract be terminated. Briefly on negligence and the uh, accessory reports. On negligence, clearly these are alternative causes of action, and to claim that we need to identify the specific individual's propensity to dangerous conduct at this stage goes against Nevada law at the pleading stage. We don't know who leaked these documents because we believe the defendants intentionally did. But if we, if discovery shows that there was a negligent action at some point, that's when the uh, obligation to produce pretend, uh, knowledge of propensity or investigate and hire. And that's exactly what the Hall case in Nevada Supreme Court held, which was when, in the course of discovery, the individual was trying to determine the circumstances surrounding the hiring of the bouncer, and that discovery was foreclosed. The case was reversed and sent back to the trial court. But when, at the pleading stage, they require us not only to identify something that needs to be determined in discovery, but then show why that person's hiring we have no access to at this point for dangerous. That goes too far under Nevada law. What we've alleged is that a harm occurred in the alternative and certainly have the ability to pursue discovery on that aspect alone. And on conspiracy and, and aiding and abetting, certainly those torts exist because the uh, ability of plaintiff John Drew to state that Commissioner Goodell acted in his capacity as an individual is sufficient at this point to allegedly be acting outside of this capacity as an alternative argument within the context of our plea in order to allow that, that motion to proceed without this court determining in what capacity Commissioner Goodell was acting at the very beginning of this case, as a matter of fact. Moreover, we have pleaded that there are rows and those that may have associated with acting in concert with the Your Honor, when preparing for this case and this oral argument, it, it did feel like many of these arguments were more appropriately addressed at summary judgment and more appropriately addressed at trial. It's certainly something that we could spend a significant amount of the day talking about these various arguments and these facts that we can eventually show and prove in our complaint. But under Nevada's legal notice plea, we've done more than that. This is a case that we believe won't only win at this stage, but will win on summary judgment and will win at trial. But certainly at this stage, this court shouldn't foreclose any of our alternative causes of action before we do it and get the second case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. So, um, if, if I may, I'll just start with the intentional court claim to make a couple of points. First of all, with regard to the argument that the truth is the defense here, it is the law in the vast majority of jurisdictions that the truth is the defense to intentional interference claims as well as defamation claims. And again, that law rests on the fundamental First Amendment principle that the provision of truthful information is protected. 
to the extent that uh, Gruden suggests otherwise, he identifies two cases which we addressed in footnote one of our reply brief, which in our view are distinguishable, for instance, because it involves a federal court sitting in diversity, making a prediction about state law. And again, we would point this court to the law from other jurisdictions, and in particular, we would point this court to the Berkey case from uh, California, which rejected any effort to draw a distinction between claims for interference with existing contracts on the one hand, and claims for interference with prospective economic advantage on the other. Now, I think with regard to the factual allegations here, I think in an effort to get out from under the potential application of the truth as a defense, Green's counsel really shifts the theory here from a theory concerning the leaking by defendants of these emails, and that is in paragraph 56 of the complaint, to a theory concerning pressure more generally. But I think that with regard to this claim of pressure, the claim is really just a claim that defendants provided emails to the Raiders. We heard talk about defendants potentially having provided the emails to the Raiders, but there's no suggestion that the defendants engaged in any other conduct. And our submission is that even if you characterize the allegations in that fashion, you're still left with the fact that what we're talking about is the provision of the emails. And we've heard a lot about the standard on motions to dismiss, and of course, this is a post-leading jurisdiction, but at the same time, it's Green himself, who in paragraph two, among other places of the complaint, concedes that these were his emails. There's no dispute about the fact that these were his emails, and when we're talking about the truth of the communications, that's what we mean, that these were, in fact, Bruden's emails, and not, for instance, someone else's. And I would point the court to the decision that we cited from, I believe, the Seventh Circuit, that's the uh, Westbrook case, for the proposition that even where there is a sustained campaign, in the words of the Seventh Circuit, uh, to have the plaintiff fired, where the statements that led to the termination were true, the truth applies as the defense. Now, I would just say a, a couple of things with regard to the other arguments concerning potential reports. The first is that to the extent that um, uh, counsel attempts to draw the distinction once again between claims for tortious interference with prospective advantage and claims for intentional interference with existing contracts, it is true that the Nevada Supreme Court has held that the absence of privilege is an element only as to the former type of claim. The Bruton simply offers no reason why those two types of claims should be treated differently for purposes of the application of the privilege doctrine, the notion that the absence of privilege is an element of the claim. And again, I didn't hear Mr. Hosmer Henner to suggest today that the eradication of racism sexism and homophobia would not be a valid justification if the doctrine of privilege is triggered with regard to the claims at issue here. And with regard to the issue of intent, the only thing I would just emphasize is that our submission is that the intent that's required here is not some sort of generic intent to do harm. It is an intent to induce the Raiders to breach their contract with Gruden or to prevent Gruden from obtaining future economic opportunities. And so while it may be true that you don't have to provide specific allegations, that's still the relevant intent, the so-called specific intent, as to those claims. Now, with regard to the negligence claims, I think the only thing that I would say is we really didn't hear anything today on our arguments concerning either the existence of a duty or the assumption of risk. And those, Mr. Hosmer and I really addressed the specific arguments with regard to negligent hiring and negligent supervision. But our arguments concerning the absence of a duty and the assumption of risk apply to all of the negligence-based claims here. And again, there's really no explanation why, as a matter of law, the NFL would have a duty to group not to disclose these emails. It's a suggestion in the briefing that there's some sort of natural duty, but there's simply no legal support for that. And with regard to the assumption of risk, we're simply resting on the principle that it absent some specific allegation of a confidentiality agreement or the like, no one has an expectation of privacy in emails once they are sent to recipients. And to the extent that there are cases suggesting that data that is provided to third parties is kept confidential, uh, that's a very different situation from the situation where you send an email 
the recipient, again, without a confidentiality agreement or some additional reason to believe that that email would not be disseminated to others. I think we can all take notice of the fact that emails are often forwarded by recipients to other parties. And finally, with regard to the claims for uh, conspiracy and aiding and abetting, I think I would just sort of underscore the fact that those claims are dependent on the claims for intentional tort or negligence, and therefore would only be able to proceed in the event that some of those claims survive. Unless the court has any further questions, we won't stand in press on for these claims. So the better thing is, this is the defendant's motion to dismiss, and it's clear to be tried, it's just such a high bar in the battle to dismiss from the beginning. If that is the defense cause of the action, which the reason can be granted, that is to take all the pleadings as true. We are in those pleading states. Um, with regard to the, the fourth issue and the truth of the defense, it is omission in the battle, so it hasn't been determined either way. With regard to specific intent, um, Mr. Osmer and Penner talked about paragraphs 52 and 55. I thought 44 through 59 that it was a whole could, could um, be supportive of uh, specific intent. Uh, quickly, at this point, I don't think the defendant has enough to proceed on this, um, this um, conspiracy. I'm going to not dismiss it now to give him a chance because I, I know that if they can't support it, they'll drop it. So uh, you can say that, but um, you, the lawyers are all three parties here. So um, they're the highest caliber, uh, they brought in the highest caliber, and so I have no concern about the plaintiff pursuing the cause of action that he can't support at another time. So for those reasons, the motion is denied. Um, and again, Mr. Hosmer Henner to prepare the order. Mr. Chandler got the team to perform with the order. We can agree to form final objection and the one third panel will take it Any questions about this? Any, any, any questions about any of the rulings? No, Your Honor, not. Okay. That's not the balance. Good enough. So, uh, the last case, thank you. Thank you.